thank everybody who's finishing up their breakfast. So I want to go ahead and get started. We don't have a lot on the agenda, but I want to make sure we got enough time to discuss the things we do have on the agenda. So I want to call the meeting of the ASMFC Executive Committee to order here October 18th in Beaufort, North Carolina. Uh, first, I want to start by thanking Kathy and all the folks from North Carolina for a great dinner last night. They did a good job, so let's give them a run. And also, uh, personally, I want to thank them for grits and sweet tea. Uh, you know, that's that's the sustenance of life for Southerners. And I would highly recommend you folks from up north in the Mason-Dixon line indulge in it, too. It's uh, it, 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 it will it, it will give new meaning to your life if you if you enjoy that kind of food. So. Um, so, so. Yeah, yeah, Pat, I think Pat's in the uh, I'll eat a grit world and it's like it's kind of hard to eat one grit you know so so uh all right um we've got an agenda before us um i've got a couple of modifications myself uh, i'll announce before i'll open it up for any other requested modifications that as we'll have a discussion on eel aquaculture under other business and we're also going to have a closed session so what we'll do during the closed session is anyone who's not a commissioner uh our proxy will be asked to, to leave uh, and then we'll also manage the online connection appropriately so any other business uh to add to the agenda this morning did i understand you might erica you might want to update on cares yeah. a little bird told me that the C C A A. yeah okay we'll add that anything else all right. Any uh, opposition to accepting the adjusted agenda? Seeing none, we'll consider it accepted by unanimous consent. We also have meeting summary from the August meeting of the executive committee. Any changes, modifications, corrections to the meeting summary? Any opposition to accepting it as presented? Seeing none, we'll consider it accepted by unanimous consent. This is the point in the meeting where we'll have an opportunity for public comment. I don't see anyone in the room. Is there anyone on line who wants to make public comment? All right, so we don't have that. So we'll move into our first uh, action item uh, for the meeting, and that's review and consider approval of the FY 2023 audit. So I'm going to call on Joe as, as chair of the Administrative Oversight Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and an email was sent out to everyone, and I think it would come as no surprise that the uh, we had a clean audit, um, <clears throat> no issues to report, um, an equity increase of $400,000, and that's tied to um, what ASMFC has accepted as uh, additional overhead for all the work that they put in for the CARES Act. Uh, so on behalf of uh, the committee, I would I don't know if we have a formal motion, but we'll put forward a motion to uh, to approve the. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, do we? Okay. Yeah. So uh, I put forward the motion on behalf of the committee to approve it. Um, it no second is needed, uh, as it is a committee motion, and I'll turn it back over to Spud. All right. Thank you, Joe. Um, any questions about the audit? Uh, I think you know it's it's another positive reflection on on the quality of our financial services that we've been able to assimilate those vast sums of money uh, with very little warning in a very complicated situation and process that through and, and come out with a clean audit. So I think uh, credit goes to to Laura and all her staff for for shepherding. Uh, those monies through, which we'll continue to do, but hopefully in the not too distant future, that'll all be cleared through and we'll get back to whatever normal is these days, which, you know, unfortunately, we uh, the commission has become too skilled at managing money. So guess what? Everybody looks at the commission to help with money. So it's a curse and a blessing at the same time, isn't it? But uh, yeah. So is there any any opposition to accepting the, the audit as reported? Seeing none, and we'll consider it accepted by unanimous consent. So, very good. All right, our next uh, agenda item is a discussion of per diem rates for meals and incidentals. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so 
this topic has been talked about uh, a couple times at the executive committee and at the um, summer meeting, we had a conversation about what the expenses would be if per diem was increased by 30% for the quarterly meeting weeks. And at that meeting, um, the executive committee asked staff, Laura's shop to go back and do an analysis of what it would cost if we increased uh, meal and per diem rate um, <clears throat> by 30% across all of our meetings, technical committees, advisory panels, and these quarterly meetings and any other travel that happens at the commission. And, um, and, and as background, the way we handle per diem rates is that we just, we um, select the prevailing federal per diem rate for any city we're in. So as federal rates move, we move right along with them. And we, um, you know, other some cities are more expensive than others, obviously, and we just adjust accordingly. And as a, you know, as the federal rates reflect inflation or other changes, we also reflect those in the rates that we provide to our, any travelers that we reimburse. Um, so when Laura's group did the analysis, it's a, it's a it's a relatively small amount of money to go up 30% across all commission meetings. It's about thirteen thousand dollars. So it's it's a relatively small amount. As you guys know, you know, plane tickets and rental cars and hotels are really where the the expenses are in our travel. The um, reimbursement for meals is only a small portion of the total. So um, it's it's up to the group where we go with that information now it's it's a relatively small amount the commission can't afford it if you guys decide that's a the uh, direction you want to move in and make that change yeah yeah that's a good point so if the um if we were to increase the per diem rate we can the base amounts or the prevailing federal rate would be taken out of our grants atlantic coastal act and other grants the 30 percent uh increase would be taken out of essentially the state dues that, that you will all provide to the commission. So um, that's happy to answer any questions, but that's kind of the background on the issue, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Bob. Questions? I uh, see uh, Roy. Mr. Chairman, do you need a motion on that big regard? Or well, uh, is this just something we can do without a, taking a formal vote? No, I think it would probably be good to formalize it through, through a motion just for purposes of documentation and uh, and to get a second, you know, so we can discuss it as a motion. Well, I'd be willing to make that motion then. Go right ahead. Do you want to just do it on the fly? Yeah, just, yeah. I think it's just move pretty much the, a 30% increase across the board. Move that the commission um, approve a 30% increase in travel allowance or per diem allowance um i think that'll that'll work on it except for um bob you mentioned some something re regarding federal funds some exception for that what was that again federal funds were paid for Base. Oh, the federal funds would pay for the base, and the thirty percent would be on um, out of commission funds. Right. Yeah, we'll, we'll get that in. Is that right, though? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just again to make that clear, uh, what Bob has said is that the in other words, the base federal rate portion of the per diem would would come from uh, basically operational funds federal grant funds and then the remaining 30 percent would be made up out of the state dues fund is that correct general administrative right okay all right so do we have a second for that all right second from dennis abbott all right any discussion on the motion uh john clark and then erica yeah i just have more of a question uh mr chair um Laura, with the increase in per diem, how does that compare to, you know, a, a lot of the meetings um, ASMLC will provide the lunch? Will this make that more comparable? Because it seems like things go faster a lot of times when the lunch is right there, especially on busy days. I think, and I've asked, I asked this question before, maybe I think what you're getting at is, okay, when we provide lunch, um is that costing us equal to what the per diem rate is or or more or less or, or whatever uh, maybe that's a question that it, it, 
costs us a lot more to provide lunch at the meetings. <clears throat> yeah. But I think that's kind of an internal decision that's, that's made given the schedule and all, because like you say, sometimes that allows us to get things done that <clears throat> otherwise we might not be able to. So, um, yeah. Uh, I'm going to go to Eric. Do you want to, Bob? Yeah, go ahead, Bob, and then I'll go to Erica, and then back to you, Dick. It is a lot more expensive to buy lunch, but as Laura always does, she uses that as leverage against the hotel. So we get free meeting rooms or free internet, or you know. So it, it's it's not a straight line expense. It can it can balance out in getting other perks. You know, the the food and beverage amount that we spend at hotels. A lot of times there is a minimum, so having those lunch lunches allows us to meet that minimum and get some of the other perks and and you know cut cut costs in other places so it's it, it's hard to make it a straight line decision all right erica then i'll go to you dennis thank you mr chair um i certainly understand that as we travel for meetings and we're um, inexpensive cities or we're relying on the most convenient food option in order to get a meal quick which sometimes can be more expensive that we may end up paying out of pocket for some of our meal expenses and per diem. Um, however, I'm not comfortable as the state agency representative from Florida to vote for something that would allow members of this body to use our taxpayer dollars to go above the federal per diem rate. So for that reason, I'm going to vote against this motion. All right, Dennis. Yes. First of all, thank you for taking this under consideration. This was a topic at our legislative meetings for, during the past year. You know, initially it seemed not unfair, but not right that in some places we were getting somewhat less per diem because I don't think anyone in any location where we meet finds that eating out is cheaper in one place than it is in another these days. So I certainly do, do appreciate and, and I also appreciate, you know, the fact that we always have at least one day of having lunch in the hotel because it, you know, keeps us from having to run around looking for meals. And I think it's much more efficient for the operation. So again, thank, thank you all. All right, Pat Kelleher. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I really appreciate Erica's uh, sentiments here as far as um, taxpayer dollars. However, I'm, I am going to support it. Um, I think a good case in point is uh, lunch the other day, Spud, that you and I and uh, uh, another gentleman had, right? When uh, Dr. Malcolm when, and, and, I, and yourself, we paid a bill that was a very simple lunch that was half of our per diem for the day. Costs have continued to increase, um, and we we need to find a way to keep pace with it at some at some point. And over the the cost overall to the commission is minimal, so I will support it. All right. <clears throat> Any other discussion, comment, questions before I call for a vote? Okay. Um, all those in favor of the motion as presented, uh, raise your hand. Let's get a count here. Can they help me? All right. Uh, all those opposed, like sign. Hot spot. Yeah, go ahead, Dennis. Is it not correct that the only voters should be members of the executive committee and not other commissioners who are sitting here? That's what I was expecting. So that we do have we have folks vote that we're not. Well, let's do it again. All right. All those in favor of the motion who are members of the executive committee signify by raising your hand. Yeah, Jeff, you're you're not on XCOM. Right. You're welcome to be here, but you're not on the executive committee. Yeah. He's abstaining. So all right, so we've got a count. Okay, uh, those opposed, like sign. 
All right. One. Uh, abstentions. One. Can't be any no votes. <laughs> if there's a no vote, see me after the meeting. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we've got a special program for you. <laughs> so, all right. So I think it is what? 13 yays, one nay, and one abstention. So motion carries. So I assume that will go into effect uh, at the winter 2024 meeting. Now, I think it's important to remember that this not only does this only apply to uh, commission meetings, or is this everything? Eight, uh, all the stuff, all this will be all functions of the commission. So, technical committee meeting, anything where we require people to travel, this will now apply. So, and that analysis you did was based based on that. Okay. It was based on 2022 meetings, and I don't know that we had a full complement of meetings in 2022 since it was after COVID. The month, so the amount could go up a little bit, but I used the best data I had for it. Yeah, so it'll fluctuate depending on activity levels from year to year. So, okay. Roy? So, Chairman, I'm wondering if you might indulge me for just a half a minute. Um, I'd like to thank the executive committee for approving this particular motion. Uh, I should point out that some members of the LGAs were disconcerted by the vote that the executive committee took at a previous meeting concerning stipends for LGAs attending uh, joint council commission meetings. Um, the reason some of the members were disconcerted is because there was only one LGA that voted on that. It was 13 um, administrative commissioners and, and one LGA, and that's how the voting worked out, 13 to one. So I, I feel that bumping up the per diem goes a, a, a little bit towards at least reimbursing LGAs for um, reimbursement expenses that they wouldn't normally receive. So I wanted to thank the executive committee for taking this particular action. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Bob? Yeah, just a quick comment. I missed the online hand. Uh, Sheree from New Hampshire voted in favor of it. So the, the final vote will be 14-1-1. Very good. All right. Uh, we'll move on. I'm going to call on Alexander for our legislative update. Good morning, everyone. I will be providing a brief uh, update on what's been happening with Congress recently. Um, I'll be talking about the budget outlook, the speakership battle, uh, our favorite bill, RAWA, uh, the Fishes Act, and some upcoming priorities that Congress has teased at potentially addressing. As you know, we uh, narrowly avoided a shutdown by passing a 47-day continuing resolution funding government at FY23 levels. Passing the continuing resolution cost Kevin McCarthy his speakership role, um, and he was ousted from that role on October 3rd, a little over two weeks ago. Um, since then, the House has been without a speaker. It's an important role in bringing bills to the floor and passing appropriations bills. Um, between the August recess and the speakership battle, Congress has been fairly unproductive recently. Uh, without a speaker, we're likely headed towards a shutdown in mid-November. The acting speaker, uh, Representative McHenry out of North Carolina, in theory could bring a bill to the floor, such as another CR, but there would need to be an overwhelming majority voting to give him that power. Um, McHenry currently just acts as a placeholder until another speaker is elected. Now to RAWA. There's been little change to RAWA since my August update. The Senate version is still working on gaining Republican co-sponsors. There will likely be two House versions of the bill. There will be the, the version introduced by Democrat Debbie Dingell of Michigan, which will be the same as the Senate version and the historical bill. Uh, the other will likely come from Republicans, and from what I've heard, will focus on compensating private landowners for habitat conservation. There's no publicly announced pay for for the bill. The Fishes Act, um, as you may remember, the Fishery Resource Disasters Improvement Act puts strict timelines on NOAA's administration of fisheries disaster support, but made no mention of 
the Office of Management and Budget's role in the process or the delays. This is a bill that was introduced by Representative Donalds uh, of Florida and would acknowledge OMB's role in the process and put a strict timeline on them. Senator Rick Scott has agreed to introduce the companion bill in the Senate, but has yet to do so. The executive committee uh, approved a letter of support for this legislation during our August meeting. That letter was then circulated to the appropriate Hill staff. On Monday, during the Lobster Board meeting, um, we were invited to testify in front of the House Natural Resources uh, Subcommittee on Wilderness, Wildlife, and Fisheries. That hearing will be on the 25th. Um, we have accepted that invitation to testify, and Bob will be the one testifying. Um, we're currently working on crafting that testimony, and we'll continue to work on it in the next few days. Some upcoming priorities that Congress has teased at addressing um, that I'm paying close attention to. Members of the House Natural Resources Committee have been eager to engage with recreational fishing issues in the past, and they'll likely engage with MREP issues. I'll be looking out closely for any uh, legislation or hearings on this topic, and we'll notify the legislative committee as appropriate. I've recently heard rumors of a Magnuson-Stevens Act reauthorization act, uh, Magnuson-Stevens Act reauthorization bill effort coming from Representative Huffman's office of California. As you may remember, he's the one that introduced uh, the reauthorization bill in the 117th Congress. Without more information, I'm assuming this bill uh, that he'll introduce in the 118th Congress looks largely similar to the one that he introduced in the past Congress. Um, similar to MREP, as information on this reauthorization effort becomes available, I'll be sharing that with the Legislative Committee and broader commission as appropriate. Some miscellaneous items. Um, I have an Excel sheet where I track all the bills that I bring to the Legislative Committee. Um, if you're curious in seeing that spreadsheet and seeing whether or not we've spoken about a bill you're curious about, I'd be happy to share that file with you. Um, I'm working on finding a file sharing system that allows for real-time updates and more comprehensive information um, that hopefully will be developed soon. Um, the final thing is, uh, I will be asking to take commissioners up to the Hill uh, at the end of January to advocate for our appropriations priorities. Um, and I just hope that you guys take me up on my offer. Thank you. Thanks, Alexander. Um, maybe just briefly talk a little bit about the Shark Act, because I think that's of, of interest to this group. And just as a sideline, I had a, was asked to speak to the leadership of the National Wildlife Federation last week to describe it. Um, and not surprising, uh, sort of given the membership of that that organization, um, the first thing I heard was, well, this is just a, a way to go out and put a bounty on sharks and, and start recklessly killing sharks again, you know, uh, uh, a.k.a. Peter Benchley's Jaws era, which I tried to quickly dismiss that, you know, that that's not the purpose of this. I mean, there may be some component of harvest change in, in the, the outcome, but uh, anyway, just if you'll just speak to that briefly. So the Shark Act is a bill that was introduced by Rob Whitman of Virginia. Um, this is a bill that would establish a task force to address shark depredation. Um, I believe I spoke about it at the last executive committee update. Uh, the main update to share since then is that it has passed out of, um, I believe, committee. Um, it would establish a task force made up of a variety of individuals. This includes individuals from each of the interstate fisheries commissions and each of the regional fisheries management councils. Um, and they would be looking at a whole host of things that I can't name off the top of my head, um, but there would be wide representation from um, us, the feds, uh, shark researchers, I believe some NGOs, and uh, some commercial fishing and recreational fishing entities. All right, thank you. Yeah, I have a question, and since we've got this august body here uh, convened, are 
in the mid Atlantic and New England are there existing or increasing interactions between trawl fisheries and sharks because in the Panea shrimp fishery of the of the southeast United States it's it's becoming devastating. I mean their their gear is being destroyed. They're putting chafing gear trying to provide a barrier for sharks, but it's uh, it's it's adding one more problem to the profitability in the Panea shrimp fishery. So I'm just curious is are uh, trawl fishers in the mid Atlantic and New England are they seeing gear damage because of shark interactions that we know of. Well, I hope it stays that way for y'all. <laughs> so yeah, Lynn. Yeah. I mean, I thank you for that. That's interesting. We were actually just down in ocean city meeting with our ocean side commercial, um, you know, crew and, and that does not come up, but we are, um, following Virginia and opening an experimental, shrimp fishery because we have shrimp that gear we have one person i think who's made it out um who's gotten himself organized to get out and it's that gear is quite small it's a very um you know petite fishing gear but we'll see what what happens with that but that, that's not something we've heard all right go ahead pat yeah spud we we've started a um it was experimental but now it's regulated um <clears throat> small small scale commercial shrimp fishery. I think we have 12 off of Virginia Beach, about eight on Eastern Shore, but I have not heard anything about this and I'll, I'll ask them or if they are seeing increased interaction. So but we haven't heard a word about that. Thanks. Uh, any questions for Alexander? Any uh, other issues related to legislation you want to bring up? Yeah, John. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Alexander, is that bill to um, separate NOAA fisheries out of commerce? Does that die or is that still around? Um, that hasn't gone anywhere and it doesn't sound like there's any appetite to take it any further. Okay, um, we'll, move, we'll move along our, our future annual meeting update from Laura. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Next year, we're going to be in Annapolis. Lynn, what do you want to say besides a little dance? It's going to be awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, we're very excited. And I would just say I've been asking folks here and there if there's anything in particular. I know most people are familiar with Annapolis because of the joint council meetings. But if there's anything in particular that uh, perks your interest that you'd like to see or do, um, there's quite a few options. It's a great town. It's very walkable. Lots of history. So if you have a particular thing, just um, let me know, send me a note, and we'll start to um, put it together. Thank you, Lynn. Um, the dates are October 21st through 24th um, of 2024. And then in 2025, we're going to be in Delaware, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll think of some great options. There's a episode of The Simpsons where they um, we're going to fly Air Delaware to vacation in Delaware. And the three top spots to vacation or to see were a screen door factory, the place where J.C. Penney sends its damaged furniture, and Wilmington. And I was at just talking to Roy about the Wilmington waterfront has actually been so improved. It's it's really a beautiful place for, for meetings, and people could take the train there. We'd be real close to Joe Biden's house. You know, a lot of exciting things. Go ahead, Roy. If I could just add to that, John and I have been in discussion this week about whether Rehoboth is the appropriate venue or, or Wilmington. Wilmington has the obvious advantage of being close to major airports in Philadelphia. Uh, Rehoboth, much less uh, more like here in, in terms of its accessibility to major airports. Uh, there's a Boardwalk Plaza is a, a really nice hotel in Rehoboth, and, and that's very attractive to be right on the boardwalk, especially for those who want to engage in surf fishing. But um, as John has pointed out, the, the Wilmington is, uh, the waterfront is is not the Wilmington of old. Uh, it, it's a, a pretty nice urban restoration project, and um, it, it might be fun to show off that particular project, but we'll see. We haven't made up our minds yet. And for the spouses tour, we'll have the screen door factory and the place where JCPenney sends the damaged furniture. 
Wow. Anyway, I'm, thank you, John. I'm breathless with right. anticipation. <laughs> <laughs> 2027, oh, I'm sorry, 2026 finds us in Rhode Island again, which I say again, but it's a little ways away, so we can talk about that later. 2027 will be in South Carolina, and 2028 will be back in Massachusetts. Thank you, Scott. Well, very good. Very good. All right. Okay, we'll move into other business. Um, I'll dispense with the items we have before we go into closed session. Um, I'll call on Pat Kelleher to talk about eel aquaculture in Maine. Uh, thanks, Bud. Um, so recently, um, uh, Canada had approached Maine uh, about their elder fishery. Um, as you can all remember that we're here around the table, um, our fishery um, was under a lot of threat as the price of elders skyrocketed. And uh, as we went forward to develop an RFP, there was always kind of an undertone around potential eel aquaculture in the United, in the United States. And so we set aside 200 pounds of quota for states um, uh, to try to take advantage of the developing uh, possible aquaculture facility. Um, as you know, Maine asked for that 200 pounds every year. Uh, there's a small company in Maine, American Anagi, um, who uh, has not only taken advantage of that quota um, by um, paying individuals to catch it for them that are licensed to elder harvesters, but they uh, also um, are purchasing at market price additional additional quota. Um, so when, when Canada came down to kind of work with us, we decided to do a tour of that facility. Um, uh, Bob, Bob Beal did come up uh, to help um, with the, to meet with them, kind of talk about the management component of ASMFC. We talked about our swipe card system and our quota work, but in the process of um, going around and talking about that and then going on this tour, um, it, was, it was pretty enlightening to see what is happening with aquaculture. This is the only facility of its kind in the United States. There's zero growth hormones being used. So they have a tank system where they pull the eels out from underneath the tank, put them into a sorting, uh, into a sorting tank, and then continue to move the eels around. Um, the, even the feeding components, these eels teach themselves how to feed themselves. They, they feed themselves when they're hungry by tapping on a, a little rod that comes out of the feeder to get the feed to drop out and they only eat until they're full. And then they go back and lay in the bottom of the tank. But, but what was more impressive is the fact that that little bit of what you think of is a little bit of quota in a, in a tank room that's twice this size maybe, <sighs> contained more yellow eels than the entire Mid-Atlantic catches commercial in one room. And it was kind of, a, it was like, okay, what we're doing now is we're taking the, uh, the elders at a very vulnerable stage with a, high, very, with a very, very high mortality, putting them into a natural, an unnatural environment, taking away that high mortality rate and growing them out. So the, 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 the economics end up working out incredibly well. Um, she wasn't really willing to share what her economics were, but, uh, but based on the fact that they built a $10 million facility in a small coastal town in Maine, I think speaks to this. And all of the eels, every one of them, are being sold domestically. None of them are going back overseas, even though uh, people are begging her to sell the product overseas. But Bob, Bob and I were talking about this a little bit, and, and I thought it was worth just bringing up here at the executive committee. Um, there, if there is interest, maybe to even talking about seeing if we could put together a tour for those who might be interested, because it, it, to me, it just, it, you know, we'd always talked about it as one of those things where, wouldn't this be great if this could happen? But now they've done it, right? I mean, it, just from a bait perspective, she could sell the stuff as bait um, and, and really take over some markets. But it, I mean, right now she's, has all she can do to keep up with the demand on the on the food supply. Um, it was so uh, it was it was it worked so well. Now she's even processing and smoking eels on site um, to to get a more value added out of the process. So um, 
I thought it was worth bringing up. Um, happy to answer any questions. Um, if there's any interest in a potential tour, happy to see if we can't try to figure out how to arrange it. But to me, it was a great, great example of making a management decision and, and, and adding value to that product long term. Um, and I think it could be a great tool going forward from, uh, from, you know, from an eel conservation perspective. We can kind of find a way to build that out. So thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks, Pat. Yeah, I, I actually stumbled across, I think it might have been on one of the food channels or something, of, of somebody went to that facility and toured it, and, you know, they were talking about the, the skill of filleting them, so they could, I mean, how this, this it, was, it was a fascinating thing, I think, but, and Bob told me that, like, the food conversion rate is like 1.5 to 1 or something, I mean, really high, it's almost like catfish and, and catfish agriculture, which is always the big challenge is the conversion rate and the profitability as well as just overall survival. So I think that's that company is called what American Imagi. American Imagi. Yeah. I N A G I. Yeah. U N yeah. U N A G I. Okay. That's weird, weird font. Yeah. Uh, well thanks for the any questions for for Pat. John? Yeah, thanks, Pat. And you had told me about this. I was curious, uh, do you know market-wise how widely she's selling these? I mean, is this the type of thing where it could support? We could encourage this in other states to have a similar facility? Yeah, I mean, she's, she was obviously very cautious about talking about her markets, but um, she gave us the impression that she had an unlimited market here in the United States that um, and uh it was looking very promising for her not not to mention if it was you, you, considering she's got companies from out of the country that want her to ship those eels to and sitting here uh looking over at uh bob's computer and the website they even have merchandise they even sell t-shirts so uh, it's the american dream you know and so uh fascinating but uh yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, as we struggle with what to do with wild eels, you know, it's uh, refreshing to see that there's some alternatives out there that uh, maybe she could uh, franchise this process. Who knows where it may go? So, all right. Um, next is I'm going to call on uh, Laura for a CAA update. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. What I'd like to do is tell you what we have left and then see if there's any decisions that we need to make today. We have $7,718,486 left, roughly. Um, and it, that's the major, a majority of the state. So I'm just going to say Massachusetts has $50,000 left, and I think you guys decided not to use it, but we can talk about it, okay? Um, Florida right now only has $2,000, and that's because something was returned to us. I can't recall the exact reason, but... That was a return check. Maine, you still have 2.8 million, and I think you're planning to spend it all. Um, Joe, at this point, you have 537,000, and I think that's for your marketing program still. We're in a holding pattern. New York, you have um, $70 left, so. <laughs> um, North Carolina has $1 left. <clears throat> Virginia, you have a million and 68, and you guys are planning, we're waiting for, yep. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> okay, you just lost me. Oh, so we're on track to spend that, right, Pat? Yeah, our application period ends at the end of this month, and we'll be sending you names and amounts okay. shortly afterwards. Uh, Marilyn, Lynn, you have $950,000 left. I know. I'm looking a little. I'm curious too. We do. Yeah. That's what my spreadsheet says. And yeah, I'll look into it a little more. Let me follow up on that. I get the sense that that might be an outstanding invoice somewhere. So yeah, let me. Yeah. Check, please check in on you. that. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Rhode Island, you have two hundred forty-five thousand dollars left, and we've got plans to spend that on. A per, yeah. um, New Hampshire, a million and fifty-eight. Sheree, online. you're online. What do you say? Yes, we'll be expending that uh, 
within the next three months. Great, thank you. In Connecticut, you have a million, and we've got plans for that too. So, so all things being equal, everything should be spent. We have until July of 2024, um, and plans to spend it all. So I don't think any decisions need to be made today. Very good. Appreciate the status update. All right, we have Eric Reed on line. He has something he wants to bring before the executive committee. So, Eric, um, if you'll unmute yourself, you can proceed. Oh, I said to say aloha, Eric. Yeah, I was I was muted, but I said aloha to start with. And and thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't want to stand between you and the hush puppies and swamp cabbage, so I'll make this relatively brief. First thing is I want to make sure that I thank uh, Mr. Law. I had to testify in front of the subcommittee up on the hill, and uh, he did some really good hand holding for me because I was pretty nervous about it, uncharacteristically nervous. But I wanted to thank him personally because he really did. A great job for me so that's the first thing uh, the second thing is I'd like to make the executive committee aware that both the New England and the Mid-Atlantic councils put forward a request to the Northeast Fisheries Science Center to develop a white paper to be submitted outlining an industry-based survey that is complementary to the spring and autumn bottom trawl survey uh, we both got presentations on how the Bigelow is doing its job and in my opinion it's not doing its job in the spring survey they missed 300 and something out of 377 survey toes and uh, we're on a quest to try to find something that will complement that survey because it has repetitively failed over the last several years so I don't know, Mr. Chair, if this is the place for a consensus statement, perhaps, or whether or not it's at the policy board, but uh, I would be seeking some sort of uh, support from the ASMFC for that council's request. So you tell me when and where you want me to do that, but I just wanted to, if there was any questions about it, I'm happy to answer them. But I think it's important that all three management bodies that, that operate uh, in the north, east um or on the same page here because it's critically important that uh that survey is conducted you know certainly when the survey fails uh the accountability of the service isn't all that great but the industry always pays so what do you want me to do here mr chair and thank you for the time all right thank you eric now certainly um let's have any questions or discussion but uh, we will bring let's bring this back before the policy board because that is the appropriate entity to discuss this and endorse uh, any sort of formal communication on behalf of the commission so if, if you'll be prepared to do that but i certainly uh, invite anybody on the executive committee to ask any questions or to comment on this at this time if they choose to so anybody or you can wait until go, go ahead bob yeah, in addition to everything that Eric said, the Bigelow is also um, approaching its midlife refit or midlife crisis, I call it. And it's going to be, um, you know, put up in dry dock for uh, the estimate is, I think, 12 to 18 months. With, that turns into 18 to 24 months usually. And, um, you know, I, there's, there's not a real solid plan or maybe no plan in place right now to fill that gap that's going to be created when that vessel's um, going through the refit. So exploring, you know, some sort of complementary industry survey or something else that can fill that, that gap during those years is going to be really important. So in order to get, get some other alternate survey up and running by, I think it's 2026, um, you know, we need to probably need to start it now, designing it and testing and, and you know, doing side-by-side uh, -side toes and other things to calibrate the information. So I think there's, you know, Seems to be a lot of reasons to to follow up on Eric's suggestion. All right, thank you, Bob. So, Eric, will you be available to bring this before the policy board tomorrow? Yes, sir, I will be. And and just just so our some incentive to our friends in the down south, one of the uh, 
options that is presented is that it that the Pisces, which does their survey work, would be put on standby if the Bigelow should fail. So basically, it's robbing Peter to pay Paul, um, and I don't think that's all that fair. So that's one of the options. If the Bigelow's out working and it can't do its job, then the Pisces will fill in. So somebody's going to get a spanking. So uh, I appreciate it, and I'll be ready to go. Thank you very much for the time. All right. Thank you, Eric. And, and we'll add that to other business for policy board tomorrow afternoon. So thank you. All right. Uh, any other business before we go into a closed session? Don't see any. So at this time, anyone who is not a commissioner or a proxy, I'd ask if you just uh, leave the room um, so we can go into closed session.